this is our last conversation. Uh, again, I promise to do more things and uh, for multiple reasons. Again, Nick asked me so why I didn't do them. And there are many reasons, some of which I wouldn't want to discuss. Some of them are that I thought that we did enough and if I want to lecture more, which I might, I will be doing somewhat different course. Again, the, this format was an interesting experiment. Uh, whether it was a success or not, I'm, I'm not certain. But of trying to do a class in a conversational manner, uh, the way we tried to do it is, was an experiment. And again, you were. Uh, Sadly enough, the, these little wet guinea pigs, <laughs> yes, uh, but uh, sort of the next class uh, when we started, which today's plan is to start it in September, is going to be uh, a regular class with uh, sort of more lecture like, like form. Uh, we shall see if, if it works better. So what I decided to do, I had many sleepless nights, believe it or not, trying to figure what should I talk about at the last lecture. And uh, actually, not just these last weeks, I have been thinking about the last lecture from the beginning of the class. I always do, because you need to know where you're sort of heading. And uh, at first, uh, my plan was to uh, give you a recapitulation of the course, sort of the highlights of the things which, which I did. And I will do so, but I decided that uh, there is an important thing I should do on top of it before that, uh, which might benefit you. Uh, again, sort of, I clearly have one advantage or disadvantage over you guys, I, I'm older. Uh, whether it's advantage or disadvantage, we do not know. It's an interesting and rather profound question. Uh, but uh, what I can do, and you cannot do, I could look back at my professional life and I could just say, what would I want if, if, you know, I look back, what I would want somebody wise to tell me when I was young, say 40. Let us, <laughs> let, let us put it like that. So. And uh, that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to start with sort of fundamental practical, what I believe, advice of how you are to uh, lead your life. Because one thing which takes a while to understand, because this is life. I mean, what we do here at work is the center of our lives. It's not our hobbies. It's this which constitutes what we are. If somebody asks me what I am, I have to say I'm a programmer. Yes, I do love opera. Some of you know that. But it's not the center of my life. You know, the way I expressed myself, the way I sort of interacted with the world through, through my life is through my work. This is true for most of us. We are what we do. Well, you all, all of you heard that we are what we eat, but, but it's actually we are what we do. And, uh, you know, some, some of us, when we are young, we think this is just this preliminary thing. And when I grow up, there will be some other thing. Guys, when you grow up, I grew up, and there is not much left. So you have to look at this activity, programming activity, as something fundamental to you, something through which you express yourself. This is metaphysical sort of thing. And I just want to very firmly remind you of that. That's what you do. Unless you become a manager, and then, of course, uh, you know, all bets are off. You know, being 
Well, that you express yourself through you know, your slaves, but uh, uh, but seriously speaking, sort of, okay, you're a programmer, so what could you do? How could you become good at what you do? And uh, some people would say, oh, well, you have to try to be like Ken Thompson or Don Knuth. No, you don't have to, for many reasons. Uh, there is one most important one. You will never be like them. Most of us just cannot be like Don Knuth, fortunately. I mean, he's a strange person. Very wonderful and great, but you know, you could be a perfectly adequate, happy, first class person without being like Don Knuth. The essential thing is that you do well what you do, not that you become famous. I'm not even going to mention Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> I guess I, <laughs> I am going to mention. So how do you become good at what you do? Sort of what you should concentrate upon. And there are several things which are very important, which sadly enough nobody tells you, or people who tell you don't listen. And, uh, let me tell you the number one thing which all of you should work on and which is essential for being a good programmer. Here my opinion coincides with Dijkstra's opinion. So what is this thing? What do you have to learn? What do you have to be really good at to be a good programmer, according to Dijkstra? And I second him. Anybody know? OK, Paul knows, but he will remain quiet. Anybody wants to guess? Now nobody could get there. So what is the number one skill without which you cannot really be a good programmer, according to Dijkstra? <laughs> Writing well. According to Dijkstra, you cannot be a good programmer unless you acquire mastery of English. Yes? Writing clear prose is essential for good programmer. You have to be able to set your thoughts on a piece of paper clearly. You should be able to communicate clearly. Again, you could say all oh, rigorous thinking. We don't know what rigorous thinking is. But ability to write, I mean, that is hard to, to sort of measure. Yes, you're right. Rigorous thinking would be wonderful. But before, hello guys, you want to join us? Ah, just in time. Happy to have you. Your interns? How lucky you. So for their, you know, they're not even 40. So, so I just started giving advice. This is the last lecture of my course and what I told you older, uh, full-time friends is that number one thing they should learn to do is to write well. Again, it is essential that you should be able to express your thoughts and thoughts about programming on paper in English in a coherent way. Anybody could tell me why it's important? There are two reasons. Why, before you start, yes? So you can get code Even before code. So you make it but it, you, you actually said both, but let's separate. I mean, the first thing that unless you could write it in English on, in, on paper, you really don't know what you're talking about. Sort of, it's a very good thing to say, I'm trying to build something. What is it? Write it in English. If you cannot write it in English, you have no idea what you are doing. Go get a job washing dishes. Right? Sort of, you say, well, shouldn't I start writing code? No, assume that your mother tongue, you say, well, but I'm not a native English speaker. Become one. Again, it's perfectly possible for a non-native speaker to become very fluent. There are several great stylists great writers who didn't learn 
in English, English writers or American writers, who learned English very late in life. Anybody wants to? Brodsky never learned, uh, <laughs> even in Russian. Uh, well, yes, he was able to write something. Whether it was comprehensible, that I don't know. Uh, the great English stylist of the sort of roughly the beginning of the 20th century, and somebody very worth reading specifically for writing good, good English prose was Joseph Conrad, who was a Polish seaman who didn't learn English till he was, I forget, 35. So yes, it is possible to acquire fluency in English. Yes, it is possible. So I'm just telling it for some of you would say, oh, well, I, it does not apply to me. Yes, it does. Okay? You have to, by the way, the person who, who sort of insists on that, remember, is Dijkstra. And he was not a native speaker. I mean, he, of course, claimed that his English was much better than any, any, I have to tell you a little story. Uh, Dijkstra wrote a great book, which I spoke in the beginning of the course, uh, called Discipline of Programming. Thank you. It's a great book, and I suggested that all of you buy it and read it. But yes, it's, it's a great book. But uh, after it was published, it was reviewed in Computing Review by a great American computer scientist, Robert Floyd, who happens to be a dissertation advisor of one of our own, Anil Gengoli, the person who is always late. Uh, so, so, so uh, and uh, Floyd decided to write sort of thorough review where he fully sort of uh, appreciated the greatness of Dijkstra's book, but at the end he decided that he has to do something special because Dijkstra was notorious for his sort of attitude that he is the only person who could write good English. Therefore, Floyd wrote the immortal words at the end of his review, and I would like to congratulate Professor Dijkstra on his English. Remarkable for a non-English speaker, <laughs> <laughs> so, so which uh, I don't think that Dijkstra ever forgave <laughs> Floyd for that. Uh, but in any case, he, he was even more more uh, proud of his handwriting. You know that, right? He sort of refused to use computers for writing because no thought could be expressed if you just use this. So you have to write longhand on a special paper. He forced the computer science department at the University of Texas Austin to order this special paper on which you could write beautiful longhand <coughs> with, of course, a real pen, no ballpoint. I mean, Anil, if you don't know what a real pen looked like, you could ask Anil Gangoli, who, <laughs> who will show you a very, very special writing. You have it with you. No, I don't have it. I have but in your office. I have, well, I have some fountain pens. Yeah, some fountain pens, yes. Uh, so it has to be a fountain pen. So again, Dijkstra was very clear, and so am I, that unless you could put your thoughts on paper, maybe not with a fountain pen, but nevertheless, you, you're not going to be a good programmer. And also, there is a second thing. You, you want to be able to communicate with other people. So the first skill you should really, and you say, it's too late for me. No, it's not too late. Right? And you could start in a very simple thing, and managers, those managers who are present, I see two. No, what is Greg? He disappeared. There's only one left. So OK, have to encourage people and strongly encourage people. They have mechanisms for strongly encouraging that for anything they do, they write in English a clear document describing what they, what they plan to do. At the end, they have to write a clear document saying 
what they have done, what worked, what they did not work, post-mortem, if you like. So this is very important skill, and you, you should gladly do it. It will help you. If, of course, at first you will not know how to do it. You, you wouldn't know where to start. But learning to do it is very important. What is the second most important skill for a programmer? Writing. Reading is good, but before reading, and that's something, I, I mean, we, we will, we'll get to reading in a second. Uh, what should you do? What every programmer should aspire to learn to do very well. Which, and again, managers should encourage them to do it, is to be able to talk. Because very often, you see somebody who purports to be a great programmer standing here like that and mumbling something in front, and you do not understand what he is saying, and he does not understand. This is not acceptable. We have to learn to talk. Again, you should always try to use every opportunity to learn how to, to present your ideas. Because presenting your ideas, let, let me tell you two two things again. You need to communicate. That's self-evident, yes? But there is another thing. 90% of my good ideas came while giving talks, right? Because you're sort of adrenaline pumps. You, you have this, this thing, and ideas come to you. So give talks. That, yes? In my case, in the process of giving talks, right? Even, you know, sort of, or we will get to it in, 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 in the third thing, which, which I will be talking about. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we always assume that the great ideas come when we sit and, and, and think. But often it comes under pressure, under fire of either giving a talk or you know, let, let me finish with giving a talk uh, part. But the, the, the next thing which I'll be talking about, having conversations. Right. So again, advice, you know, always try to give talks. Again, I still, some of you might remember when I came to A9, I gave a talk saying that we should attend conferences, give talks. And people were saying it's impossible. Now, it is possible. The main reason which we don't is we don't try. Remember, there is the, there was, once upon a time, there was a fellow called Ryan Ernst. Huh? Long gone. But in any case, you don't get it, but he just left last week. <laughs> so uh, a great, a great guy. And uh, made me very sad when he, he left. But in any case, he is always trying to give talks in all kinds of external forums. For example, he talked to John about giving a talk at John's conference. And again, I think it's great that John is organizing these things. And again, those of you who can, maybe you should talk to John about giving some presentation at his conference and many other forums. Okay? So you have, and use it. You have to learn to speak. This strong and silent type doesn't work. You have to learn to talk. Sort of the art of public speaking nowadays is forgotten, but it's necessary for you. So the advice is take it very seriously. And then finally, in terms of this, we will get to, 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 to other things. You have to learn to converse. One of the problems which I see with the younger generation of programmers is that conversation tends to go like that. You're wrong. <laughs> have you seen that? I don't want to name names. But there are people in this organization for whom the art of argument is just that. This is 
terrible thing for you. I'm not trying to say that you insult other people, that you are rude. The terrible thing that you are not learning from other people. Whomever you talk to, even the most inept, seemingly inept person, usually sees something you do not. So learn to listen. It's again, it's a very good thing. And you know, I, see, I do not do it like that, but I see many people who sort of successfully do the following. They, they go around, for example, my friend Dan Rose, some of you might remember even him. He was here yesterday, by the way. Uh, so uh, he always goes around with a notebook. And whenever he listens, and he's very good at listening, he takes notes. Try to listen, for example, if you talk to, say, Nick, try to listen to what he is saying, not just to what you want to tell him, right? Because he might have something to say and take notes. This is very, very important thing which we have to bring back. So I'm just trying to, I, mean, I understand that it might sound like patronizing, but it's not patronizing. Again, I used to do all of that. I was very much into, you are wrong. Yes? And it took me years to realize that maybe listening is good. So, you know, you say, well, but now you're sitting here on this tall chair and pontificating. They make me do it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the learning, to, learning this art of conversation is very, very, very important. Okay. So we're done with this touchy feely stuff. But mind it, it's not touchy. I have a question. Sure, sure. Uh, would you do things different if somebody told you exactly that when you were 14? When I was 14, I wouldn't understand a word. <laughs> Perfect. No, I, I, am, I am just being honest. Yes? I learned many things from people telling me things like that. Let me give you very specific instances. Okay. I, once upon a time, I thought it was very important to be number one, right? to, to be the smartest. And even if collaborated with people, I knew that it's oh, it's so very important that in this collaboration, I'm somehow number one. And uh, say 1981, when I was a youngster, I was 31 years old, uh, I wrote a paper with two friends of mine. And let me just say that I, I did most of the work. I came up with an idea. Just, it's a long time ago. It's, they, they'll forgive me for mentioning. And I was uh, talking to our boss, a great computer scientist called Phil Lewis. I was very fortunate to have uh, very many good bosses who taught me many things. And he asked, ah, so whose idea, because the, I mean, the paper had this central idea, whose idea was that? And my mouth opened to say, of course, mine. And then he sort of interrupted himself and me, with me sort of standing with my mouth wide open, uh, saying, well, but of course, in a joint work, these are joint ideas. And I learned. Right? I sort of, I actually realized at that point that it's true. And what does it mean? It means, let, let me. For example, here in the room, we have a person with whom I collaborated for many years, dear Leopold, Paul McJones, and he tends to be quieter than I am. Are you quieter than I am? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so you might think that, say, if we write a book, this mostly I who is talking. But you see, it doesn't work quite like that, which is, by the way, is true. Of course, it's I who is always talking. But every single thing in the book, which we wrote together, is joint work. That is, I wouldn't have said it if it were not for Paul. This is the conversation. There was going this conversation where 
you know, I would say something and he would frown. Huh? He wouldn't even say. He would <laughs> I say, oh yes, he's right. And I, I'll go. So if you look at the number of words, you would say, oh, Alex said more. But the contribution, honestly speaking, the book wouldn't be at all the way it is if it were not for Paul. It's literally 50-50. Yes? I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able. It's not that, you know, it's 50-50. It's and that's how royalties are split, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so, so. No, I, you know, it's 50, but you have to learn it. You have to truly understand that in any collaboration, you know, you, you would always be better at something. Right? Like I was better at something and Paul was better at some other things. And that's, that is very valuable. Right? So I'm just saying, but how did I learn? I learned it from Phil Lewis in 1981, I know, because he told me. He told me to shut up my big mouth. And, you know, I spent a lot of time, sort of, since that time, that was like 33 years ago, thinking on that, on the nature of collaboration, how they work. And, you know, I'm, I'm actually, by now, pretty good collaborating with people. If you look at my resume, I wrote many books, papers, and things like that with other people. But you have to learn, and one of the things which I see, for example, in modern, organization, for example, A9, that people do not collaborate. You have to learn to collaborate. And all of this ability to talk, ability to write, help with that. Yes? Did I answer the question? So yes, we could, be, we could be trained. This is, again, will my words affect all of you? No. Most of you will listen and forget. But somebody will remember, maybe. You know. There was a great Russian poet, Tutchev. He wrote, Nam, I'll translate. Nam ne dano pridugadat, kak nasha slova adzavyotsa. We cannot foresee how our words will affect people. They really, we really cannot. But we have to, you know, when, especially when we are forced to talk, as I am, we have to try to say something which might do some good. So this is why I'm saying learn to write, learn to speak, learn to converse. These are essential for you to become a good programmer. And of course, there are counterexamples. You could point to some great programmers who, for example, you know, cannot write or not very good writers or for sure give terrible talks and cannot converse with anybody but themselves. But we are not, you know, we are not to learn from them their bad things. This is part of the problem with, again, young people will often sort of say, oh, you see there is this great programmer and he never shaves. Therefore, if I'll stop shaving, this is, <laughs> You know, I'll become great. It doesn't work like that. This is this unfortunate thing about Einstein, who was, you know, a great scientist, no question about it, but he didn't like haircuts. <laughs> Therefore, people decided that in order to be a genius, you have to avoid, you know, getting that doesn't work like it. Again, we should not learn things like that from Einstein. For example, you know, if you decide to imitate me, do not imitate my weight. <laughs> so, no, no. Imitate his weight. I'm poor, or, or Paul's I mean, there are people who can control their appetites, not me. Uh, so, but, you know, we have, we have to, we have to, okay. Second thing, sort of, now let us get to more specialized things, sort of, what do, do, would I like you to learn what I think it's important to learn, to be a good programmer, and let me, let me tell you, survive long term. Because one thing which 
you will have to face is that we live in the world of fast changing technology. So you say, okay, I'll learn Hadoop and I'll be great. Now you'll be great for six years. Then you'll be unemployed. I don't know, Hadoop might live eight years, but you know, <laughs> this, is, this is the sad fact of modern reality, that most things which are fashionable, Hadoop or Scala or uh, aspect-oriented programming, whatever that might be, they disappear. Right? So you go and, sadly enough, the schools now, you went to the things called colleges, uh, they become more and more concentrated on these transitory things. What they do not understand is that, I mean, you know, I was shocked at some point when I saw that David Patterson, anybody knows who David Patterson was? A great computer architect. Yes, indeed, first class, no question about it teaches a course on Ruby on Rails. <laughs> I'm not making it up. Huh? Because he, you know, and I understand all the pressures. You know, nobody cares about computer architecture. And Ruby on Rails, at least two years ago, was hot. <laughs> I'm not sure it's hot today. I mean, it's, it's one of these things. I don't think there should be a course at Berkeley. He's at Berkeley on Ruby on Rails. I'm not, by the way, saying that Ruby on Rails are good or bad. I just don't think there is a place for Ruby on Rails in the you know, distinguished universities such as Berkeley. Berkeley is a very great university. Anybody from, well, Paul is from Berkeley. Ah, you know, a whole bunch of, is it a great university? Yes, it is a great university. It's not worthy, well, Ruby of Rails is not worth it to be taught at, at, at Berkeley. Right? So the, the important thing, you have to remember that all these fashionable things do not constitute education. I mean, they be practically important, but you are not going to survive if you learn just them, because they will disappear. Because you, yes. I won't be talking about just that. It's a very good question, but I'm just about <laughs> to, to say that. Okay, sort of the question. Okay, let me answer shortly, uh, since uh, you, know, you asked the question. In my opinion, the key to long-term innovation is fundamental science. Okay, it's as simple as that. If we, as a society, or if you as a person are to innovate, you have to invest either collectively as a society or individually as a person, and I'll be talking in very specific terms, into fundamental things. It's, you know, it's tempting to say, let us abolish physics, mathematics, chemistry, and teach Ruby on Rails and accounting. Could a society survive? Yes, and for centuries. We have historical examples. There was a very great empire called the Roman Empire. Were they great? They were absolutely great. Right? Any, any you know, society which survives as long as they, they have is a great society. And they established many wonderful things, like what? Roads like water supply, but civil engineering in a practical way throughout a large section of the world 2,000 years ago, you had cleaner water than most areas of the world have now. You had plumbing. I mean, they didn't have indoor plumbing. They had outdoor plumbing. They actually believed in uh, doing it collectively. They would build a nice sort of place where everybody would go do his thing and it will be taken out of but cleanliness yes they had great cleanliness okay there was a society 
which, for example, provided you with wonderful opportunity to wash yourself every day for free. For example, if you ever go to Rome, that's in Italy, uh, you go visit Baths of the Caracalla. There is this, they ruined now, but the Caracalla, Emperor Caracalla built this enormous thing where everybody for free, free or slave, anyone, could go and take baths. We could not even hope, you know, with hot pools, cold pools, ice, I, whatever. So, and massage, and, ah, all kind of wonderful things. Sort of the Romans knew very well that, you know, well-functioned society should be a clean society. By the way, after empire collapses, the baths stopped running, and Europe did not become clean till when? maybe beginning of 20th century. In the Middle Ages, there were wonderful things, but people didn't wash. Right? So it took a while to restore this cleanliness. But what Romans did not have? Fundamental science. They stopped, they basically, you know, some of you heard this talk by, by me, but, you know, the research stopped in literally 1211 BC, what happened? They killed Archimedes. Sort of in, in some sense, it's, it's, it's a symbolic act. But literally, Romans said, we don't need to invest in mathematics. Our engineers will use the great results by the Greeks, but they will not advance anymore. That's enough. We have enough. And the research stopped. Literally, there is this amazing fact that, for example, in whatever extant Latin translations of Euclid, there are no proofs. They're just theories. Nobody bothered. I mean, you know, it's an important thing to know the results. But all this proof stuff, nobody cares. And things stopped. So society could function. Roads could be built. Civil engineering could function. You know, stock exchange will work. But what you're talking about, innovation will stop, right? Because innovation is based on, and it's hard to prove, in a sense. People say, well, look at Amazon. We don't support any basic research. And, you know, we flood the world with stuff. Uh, but I think what you clearly see is that societies where innovations originate at some point invested in science. Right? It's, just, it's just so. Right? And I believe that in spite of, you know, right now it's not a fashionable thing to say. And, you know, I'm going to get to practical what you should do. And it's going to be a very, very unfashionable thing. Some of you might even know, since I have been talking about it for many, many decades now, so in order for you, okay, you say, well, so what do you mean? Do you mean me to be Einstein? No, of course, I don't mean for you to be Einstein. By now, you have to resign yourself to not having any gifts like Einstein. It's pretty clear that if you made it to this point, <laughs> you are no Einstein. Yes? And this is perfectly all right. It's perfectly all right. You know, I... We, we have to, you know, when you are very young, like 14 years old, you think you could be a great footballer and sing at the opera and be a great actor and Einstein, especially if you stop, you know, you should see my pictures at that age. Uh, <laughs> you know, stop cutting your hair, you know, you would, you would be a great person. And then the reality strikes. You realize, no, you know, you actually are not going to be like Pelé or like Maria Callas, or like, do I have, I have to be just a programmer at A9. <laughs> you know, but we have to accept it, guys. It's perfectly all right to be a programmer at A9, especially if we are good programmers. I do not mean that if we are not good programmers, A9 will fire us. Let, let me tell you, you could be a perfectly terrible programmer mm -hmm. and retain your employment at least for six years. I know an example, 
at this company. <laughs> so, you know, I, by the way, I know an example. This person didn't just didn't know how to program. For about, I think, eight months, he was transferred from one group to another. And he was sort of not attending. You know who I'm talking about. Nobody knew you, and he, he survived it sort of, for eight months. So there are all kind of wonderful things possible in modern bureaucratic organizations. And yes, you, but you really don't want to be a bad programmer for yourself. Because remember where I started? That's what you are. You want to be great programmer in what you do. It doesn't mean that you want to be like Ken Thompson, recognized and have a long beard and fly planes, but uh, have a red Corvette. Uh, but what you want is you really want to write the code which you write for the local search, which is really good, which really does things well, which other people, when they inherit your code, will look and say, wow. And I don't mean wow, I mean <laughs> wow. <laughs> So, no, but you want, you want good wow. You really do, okay? So, let's go eat. Then I will get to practical advice. What you have to, to learn. How, how do you become a great scientist while remaining at A9? Sort of what, what, what you have to do.